Well, we're in Genesis 42. Again, we're, we're going to try and do four chapters, so why waste any more time? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this evening. Lord, we thank you for your word that it will not return void, um, that your word will endure forever, and we have your Holy Spirit with us here tonight to teach us and guide us and direct us. So, Lord, I pray you would remove all the distractions, all the things that would keep us from hearing from you this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Genesis chapter 42, starting in verse 1. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do you look at one another? And and he said, Indeed, I have heard there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers. For he said, Lest some calamity befall him. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain. Among those, who, among those who journeyed for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all one man's sons. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. But he said to them, No, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said, Your servants are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan, and in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. Now, as we saw previously in Genesis 41, we saw how David interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, and he told Pharaoh, Look, there's a famine coming in in the land. There's a famine coming. Seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. And in those seven years of plenty, we see that Pharaoh made Joseph second in command to Egypt. In fact, the only thing Joseph didn't have access to in Egypt was Pharaoh's throne. He says, everything else is yours. And you know, all the problems, they're going to come to you. You deal with it. You handle it. Well, the famine was so bad that we see that even in Canaan, where Joseph's family was, It reached there, and it was so bad that they'd run out of supplies, they'd run out of food, but they heard, hey, there's there's grain in Egypt. He had heard there was grain in Egypt. And we know that that's because God gave Joseph the wisdom to store up all the extra grain from those seven years of plenty, so that way they had stockpiles for the seven years of famine. And apparently they had so much stockpiled that they were able to sell to other nations. Something maybe current nations might think about. <laughs> and maybe don't sell what we already don't have a lot of either. <laughs> but Egypt had so much that they were able to sell to other nations. People were able to come from all over the world, and, and where would they go? They would go to Joseph. At this point in time in, in the world, Egypt was the number one ruler on the face of the earth. Pharaoh was essentially king of the world, and Joseph is number two. So anyone coming to buy grain, whether they were in Egypt or outside of Egypt, would come to Joseph, and we have this problem. In Canaan, there's no grain, and Jacob sends his sons, all but one, notice that, all but Benjamin, to go to the land of Egypt to buy grain. It's interesting he doesn't send Benjamin. Um, If you remember, Benjamin was the the youngest son that Jacob had, and the second son of the wife that he loved, Rachel. Rachel. Remember that whole um, competition of who could have the most kids? First it was Leah having all the kids, then she became barren, so um, uh, she used her servant, and Rachel used her servant because she was barren. Finally, at the very end, God opened Rachel's womb, and she had two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. And now, especially that Joseph is gone, and Jacob suspects him to be dead, Benjamin is his favorite son. 
And so you can imagine the last time he sent all of his sons away, one didn't return. He says, I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to hold on to at least my favorite. He didn't want anything to happen to him. Which we'll find out is probably, probably a good thing, and it works out in the favor especially of Joseph. And when Joseph's brothers show up to Egypt, it says here that they had no idea it was Joseph. Joseph had been part of Egypt now um, for years. He would have been shaved, shaved head, shaved face. We also know a lot from history that uh, those in leadership in Egypt, you know, they, they had makeup, all sorts of different things. It says here too that he spoke roughly with them, or maybe your Bible says harshly. He didn't speak to them in Hebrew, but he spoke to them the Egyptian language. He spoke through an interpreter. We'll find that here out in a second. So they had no idea this was Joseph, but Joseph knows these are my brothers. Joseph didn't have any idea about this. Joseph didn't say, you know, okay, God's going to have this famine and it's going to go across the whole land and it's going to bring my family back to me and then they're going to have to bow down to me. Because notice what the text says here. It says that as they're bowing down to him and saying, no, we're not spies, he recounts his dreams he had. He kind of gets a deja vu. You ever had that where you thought it was a dream and then all of a sudden you're driving along and you're like, wait a second, I've been here before, but you never have and you're like, What's going on here? He remembers the dream he had, the dream that he was ridiculed for. And now these brothers are bowing down to him, fulfilling that dream that he had. And throughout this story, we'll see that Joseph kind of plays uh, hardball with his brothers. <laughs> He accuses them of being spies, right? Because you guys are only here to see the nakedness of the land. You are trying, in, in our time of famine, you're going to try and come over and take over Egypt. He accuses them of being spies, which they adamantly deny, but they also do something that, to Joseph, works out to his advantage, and they give up some information about their family. He says, look, we're, we're all the brothers of, of one man back in Canaan. Our father who's still alive and, and we still have another younger brother who's back with our father, which Joseph knew was Benjamin, his only full-blooded brother. And then notice what they say at the end of verse 13. And one who is no more. Little did they know they were speaking to the one called no more. <laughs> they didn't even say his name. Well, in verse 14, we see that Joseph's gonna come up with a plan to get them to show, to get them to try and be honest and to confess to what they did. In verse 14, but Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you saying, you are spies. In this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, which is something um, a, an Egyptian person would say, surely you are spies. So he put, all them, he put them all together in prison for three days. Then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison house. But you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses and bring your youngest brother to me so your words will be verified and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore the distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Therefore his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes." We can kind of see here that Joseph, is what he's trying to do, he's not trying to have revenge on his brothers. He's not trying to scare his brothers. It seems like he's trying to get his brothers to confess to the crime that they did of selling him into slavery, leaving him basically for dead. 
In verse 13, when they said that they have one younger brother at home and one who is no more, they didn't say, and we had one younger brother who was sold into slavery and it was us who did it and we feel so bad about it. No. They're still trying to cover up their, their, their tracks, still lying about it years later. And finally, when they're all put in prison and they've been there three days, I'm sure this is eating up at Joseph. We see after three days, Joseph goes to them and is like, look, you know, I'm not going to make you guys stay here. Let one person stay and I'll send you with the grain back to your family because he cared about his dad. They were there to get grain because they were as a famine. And Joseph, even though these are his wicked brothers who haven't yet confessed to him, still says, look, let me send you with some grain. Go home, take care of your family. But bring back that youngest brother and for surety, I'll keep one of you here in prison. This is another test. They had already given up one brother. Had no problem with that. Now let's see if they're able to give up another brother. To keep another brother in prison. You know, they could say, whew, we got out of there. I mean, Simeon stinks for him, but uh, yeah, we're not going back. <laughs> he thought we were spies. That guy was crazy. Simeon's a, he, he's an adult. He'll figure it out. It's really an interesting contrast to the story, what we saw earlier, when all of his brothers are conspiring against him. And now they're humbled, they're at his feet, and they're under his command. Before, Joseph's life was in their hands. They threw him in a pit. Then they sold him into slavery. But now Joseph is in complete control. They are now in prison under his command. Now Joseph, he gives some hints to who he is a little bit. All right, notice there he says in verse 18, do this and live for I fear God. An Egyptian wouldn't say that. An Egyptian would say I fear Pharaoh or one of their gods that they worshipped in Egypt. That might have thrown the antennas up a little bit, but probably not because they were so worried about their own selves and their own predicament. Notice they, they start, consp not conspiring, but they, they get together and they're like, this is all because of what we did to Joseph years ago. It's finally coming back to bite us. A and they're sitting there talking about it and Reuben gets up and says, didn't I tell you to leave the lad alone? Didn't I tell you don't do that? Now his blood is required of us. Again, they, they think he's probably dead at this point. And as the text tells us, little do they know, Joseph is sitting there hearing everything and it's eating him up so much that he runs away and he weeps. Throughout the story, we'll see that Joseph really has no ill intent towards his brothers at all. He really just wants to see them confess. He wants to see, you know, he can see that the bitterness and the anguish and the, the weight and the burden of what they did to him years ago is still eating at them. We'll see later on when finally he really has the ability to kill them or do whatever he wants with them. He forgives them. Joseph desired to see reconciliation between his brothers, not revenge. And so he takes Simeon and he tells him to go with grain, but there's a catch. We'll see here in verse 25. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain to restore every man's money to his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. Thus he did for them. Again, he's really taking care of his brothers here. He's making sure they have no problems. So they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, so a little later on, he saw his money, and there it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored, and there it is in my sack. Then their hearts failed them, and they were afraid, saying to one another, what is this that God has done to us? I mean, it looks like they stole the grain at this point. Then they went to Jacob their father in the land of Canaan and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who was lord of the land spoke roughly to us and took us for spies of the country. 
But we said to him, we are honest men, we are not spies. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father, and one is no more. The youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the country, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me, so I shall know that you are not spies, but that you are, an honest, uh, you are honest men. I will grant your brother to you, and you will trade in the land. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly each man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And you want to take Benjamin? All these things are against me. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. So Joseph takes care of his brothers, but to them it's, it's a curse. And in the culture it would have been. They were there to buy grain, but they leave with grain, but they never paid. And so now they're thinking, the guy in Egypt probably thinks we ripped him off. And when they tell their dad everything, their dad is just as afraid, just as confused, just as bereaved, as he says. He says, well, first, you tell me Joseph's dead. Now you tell me Simeon is locked up in prison. Basically, he's dead. And now you want to take Benjamin from me. You guys are crazy. You guys want me to go down to sorrow to the grave. And we see that Jacob would not allow them to take Benjamin. Notice this. Ja- Jacob doesn't say, you know what, you're right. Let's go get Simeon back. But we'll see here in the start of chapter 43. They wait until they're out of grain again to finally say, you know what, I, we, I guess we're going to have to go back. We have no other choice than to go back. We'll see this is all orchestrated by God. This isn't their plan. This isn't Joseph's plan. We'll see this is all the Lord. In verse 40, chapter 43, Now the famine was severe in the land, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. But Judah spoke to him, saying, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, you shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. And Israel said, why do you deal so wrongfully with me as to tell the man whether you still had another brother? Why do you have to give up that information? (laughs) But they said, the man asked us pointedly about ourselves and our family saying, is your father still alive? Have you another brother? And we told him according to these words. Could we possibly have known that he would say, bring your brother down? I mean, we didn't know he was going to ask us to to bring him down with us. We were just trying to get out of the fact that he thought we were spies. Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring back, if I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. For if we had not lingered, surely by now we would have returned the second time. And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so, then do this. Take some of the best fruits of the land in your vessels and carry down a present for the man a little balm a little honey spices and myrrh pistachio nuts and almonds take double money in your hand and take back in your hand the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks perhaps it was an oversight take your brother also and arise go back to the man and may god almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and benjamin if i am bereaved i am bereaved So again, they tried to go without having to take Benjamin, but finally when they run out of grain, they say, look, Dad, we don't have any other choice. If we're going back to Egypt, 
We have to take Benjamin. Now again, this was all God's plan. This was all God's doing. God's the one who talked about the plenty in the land that caused it so that Egypt was the one who would have all the grain. God's the one who allowed the famine to come throughout the land that would cause Jacob and his sons to go to Egypt and, be encounter, and, and have to be under Joseph's command. God is the one who gave Joseph this wisdom. We'll see it was all God's doing and, and, and Joseph will even say that, look, this was all God's doing. This wasn't your doing. But they had to go to Egypt and they had to bring Benjamin. And when jo- Jacob finally relents, he says, look, if you're gonna do this, let's make it so that way we're doing everything we can to please this man. Let's bring him gifts, balm, honey, and most importantly, most importantly, let's lean on the mercy of God. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. It's an interesting point for Jacob. He's already lost one son. In a way, he's got one son in jail and he's thinking he might as well, he might lose his other son that he loves so much. And he realizes this is a, there's just a time where you just have to let go. There's a time where you have to just eventually trust in the mercy of God as a parent. Now what Joseph, Jacob does is he, he sets them up for, for success. He gives them all the presents, double the money, plus the money that was in their sacks, and the mercy of God. Now I'm not there yet, thankfully, but I'll be getting there soon with my children. But there comes a time when, as parents, we just have to allow, we have to trust in the mercy of God. We set them up for success as much as we can. You know, provide for them, give them the right kind of schooling, raise them up in the way that they would go. But in the end, it's gonna be the mercy of God. And we'll see here, it's all according to God's plan. This whole time, Jacob's whole family was in God's hands. And for Jacob, this is, this is something he's been learning his whole life. For Jacob, remember his whole life, he's been a schemer. He's been a divisor of plans. Hey, something goes wrong and guess what? I'll find a way out of it. I'll do this, I'll do that. His name means deceiver. But he had to learn that it wasn't up to him. It was up to the Lord. And, and even in his old age, he's still learning. It's up to the Lord. And in verse 15, we see what happens. So the men took that present and Benjamin and they took double money in their hand and arose and went down to Egypt and they stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my home and slaughter an animal and make ready for these men will dine with me at noon. Then the man did as Joseph ordered and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. Now the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house and they said, it is because of the money which was returned in our sacks the first time that we are brought in so that he may make a case against us and seize us to take us as slaves with our donkeys. When they drew near to the steward of Joseph's house, they talked with him at the door of the house and said, oh sir, we indeed came down the first time to buy food, but it happened when we came to the encampment that we opened our sacks and there... Each man's money was in the mouth of his sack, our money in full weight, so we have brought it back in our hand. And we have brought down other money in our hands to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. But he said, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their donkeys feed. Then they made the present ready for Joseph's coming at noon for they heard that they would eat bread there. Now when Joseph sees Benjamin, it says that he's overcome with emotion and he says, goes to the steward of his house and says, look, I want to prepare a feast. And not just for Benjamin, but for all of his brothers. Go send the guys to my house, prepare a feast, I'll be there at noon. 
Now, of course, this scares the brothers. They don't know what's going on. They say, well, he's setting us up. He's gonna, this is going to be an aha moment. Remember the story of Esther? Where Esther does this big feast with the king and Haman. And Haman thinks, oh, I'm, I'm with the king and, and Queen Esther. Like, this is going to be good stuff. I'm, I'm a man of, of honor. And then, gotcha. This is the guy that's trying to hurt me and my people. They're thinking, oh no. And this is way before Esther, obviously. But they're thinking, oh no. He's coming here to, to get us, to capture us, to enslave us. And so they confess to the steward of Joseph's house and they say, look, last time we were here, um, you know, he thought we were spies. We left with grain, but we also left with the money in our sack and we didn't put it there. We didn't steal it. In fact, we've come back to give the money back plus buy more grain with more money. And notice what the steward of the house says. It is very interesting, verse 23. Peace be with you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. The whole time he never meant harm to them. And the whole time the steward, most likely an Egyptian or maybe from a different area, says your God and the God of your father, speaking of Jehovah, Yahweh, Peace be with you. Again, we see the Lord the whole time was over this. I think we can also see the influence Joseph had even on the stewards of his own house, his own servants. They could see his, how he served the Lord, how he trust the Lord. They could see, yeah, it was the Lord. They didn't say, oh, Pharaoh did this or Joseph did this, but he says it was the Lord who did this. This is something throughout Joseph's life that we can see that people could see the influence of the Lord on Joseph li- Joseph's life. Joseph wasn't going into Potiphar's house and, and street preaching to everyone. No, but he worked hard. He was honest. He was good. And Potiphar could see that. When he got down to prison, which he was, shouldn't have been in there anyways, but he was wrongfully accused and he's down in prison, the captain of the guard didn't put Joseph in command because he was such a great preacher. It's because he was an honest man. And you can see the favor of the Lord on his life. And Joseph isn't second in command because he came up with this plan and device. In fact, when he met Pharaoh, he says, Pharaoh says, look, I heard that you can interpret dreams. Joseph says, I can't do anything, but God can interpret your dreams. Something even his father experienced with Laban. Laban was being blessed all this time, not because of Laban was good, but because Jacob was following the Lord. Jacob was serving the Lord. That's to say that when we're serving the Lord, people will see it. People will notice it. Throughout the New Testament, we're told, oh, we're encouraged and exhorted many times to let people see our good works. Let people see the work of the Lord in our lives so that way they themselves will glorify God. Jesus says that. Peter says that. Paul says it. There was no harm meant for them. And in verse 26, we'll see this feast. It's an interesting feast. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed down before him to the earth. Then he asked them about their well-being and said, is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? I mean, you could just see, he just, really, he just wants to see his dad. He's seen his younger brother and he just wants to see his dad now. And he wants to be with his family. He loves his family. And they answered, your servant, our father, is in good health he is still alive. And I'm sure they're wondering, why is he so worried about our younger brother, our father? Like, what, what's this guy's deal? And they bowed their heads down and prostrated themselves. Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Now his heart yearned for his brother. So Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. Again, probably if I have some official business I need to get to, goes to his room, starts crying. Comes back. 
And he went into his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out and restrained himself and said, serve the bread. So they set him a place by himself and them by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because the Egyptians could not eat food with the Hebrews for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked in astonishment at one another. Then he took servings to them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as theirs, so they drank and were merry with him. And it's just, just an odd. They're sitting there looking astonished at one another, saying, what is going on? This guy accuses us of being spies, puts the monies back in our bag, wants our younger brother here. We get him here. He has a feast for us. He's asking us about our dad. He's running in and out of the room to do something. And now he's given Benjamin five times as much as everyone else. Like, what is, what is with, this is weird. This is not normal. This is not how an Egyptian ruler should act. They couldn't believe what was happening. They were probably confused. And in chapter 44, we see that it continues. And he, can, he commanded the steward of his house, saying... Fill the men's sack with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away in their donkeys. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, Get up. Follow the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you return, repaid evil for good? Is not this the one from which my Lord drinks, and with which indeed he practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So he overtook them, and he spoke to them these same words, and they said to him, Why does my Lord say these words? Far be it from us that your servants should do such a thing. Look, we brought back to you from the land of Canaan the money which we found in the mouth of our sacks. How then could we steal silver or gold from our, your Lord's house? With whomever your servants it is found, let him die, and we also will be my Lord's slaves. They spoke too soon. And he said, Now let it be according to your words. He with whom it is found shall be my slave, and you shall be blameless. Then each man speedily let down his sack to the ground, and each opened his sack. So he searched. He began with the oldest and left off with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and each man loaded his donkey and returned to the city. So Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, and he was still there, and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Did you not know that such a man as I can certainly practice divination? Then Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do so. The man in whose hand the cup was found, he shall be my slave. And as for you, go up in peace to your father. We see that Joseph isn't done with his brothers. Joseph has his special cup put in Benjamin's sack, unbeknownst to the brothers. Now again, Joseph isn't trying to get revenge here. He seems to be trying to get them to confess, to repent. And when the brothers are confronted with the crime, they are so sure that they didn't do it. They say, let the person who's found, let it, you know, he can die and we'll all be your slaves. Little did they know that was going to be Benjamin. And when this happens, they knew their father would be devastated. They said, oh my, you know, they just couldn't believe it. Why did it have to be Benjamin. Now, fortunately, Joseph was not going to kill Benjamin. Notice, Judah said, whoever is found, let that person die. The servant and Joseph says, that person will be my slave. Joseph wasn't going to kill anyone. He never tried to say that. But he was going to send his brothers back to his father without Benjamin. Which, to them, they're like, might as well kill us. Because our father's going to kill us if we get home without Benjamin. 
Note, remember also what Judah said to his father before they left. Judah said to his father, I will be surety for Benjamin. I will make sure he returns. Well, Judah speaks up, verse 18. Then Judah came near to him and said, O oh my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing and do not let your anger burn against your servant for you are even like Pharaoh. He knows that just asking this in Joseph's position, Joseph could just have him killed if he wanted. My Lord asked his servant saying, have you a father or a brother? And we said to my Lord, we have a father, an old man, and a child of his old age who is young. His brother is dead, and he alone is left of his mother's children, and his father loves him. Notice, he, they still say, Joseph is dead. They're still not confessing to what they have done. Even though they've twice now said that this is happening because of Joseph's blood on their hands. And yet they're still just scheming, conniving, deceiving then you said to your servants bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him and we said to my lord the lad cannot leave his father for if he should leave the father his father would die but you said to your servants unless your younger bro youngest brother comes down with you you shall see my face no more so it was when he went up to your servant my father that we told him the words of my lord and our father said go back and buy us a little food but we said we cannot go down if our youngest brother is with us. Then we will go down, for we may not see the man's face unless our younger brother is with us. Then your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely he is torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. But if you take this one also from me, and calamity befalls him, you shall bring down my, ha my gray hair with sorrow to the grave." Now therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. So Judah just lays it out. He says, look, if Benjamin doesn't go back, our dad's dead. Our dad's just gonna die. Please, I will stay here. Now we're starting to see some conviction some sort of repentance. Judah doesn't say, you know what, I mean, that's dad's favorite too. Maybe it is good that he's gone. First he had Joseph, we got rid of him, and dad still didn't like us. He liked the other brother as well. Starting to see some working on Judah's life. He says, look, I'll stay here. Now he almost confesses what he did to Joseph. But he says, but he's probably torn to pieces. He was close. And it's just amazing how we will hold on to lies so much that we start saying the lies so much, we believe them to be the truth. And the enemy does the same thing to us. Tells us all the lies, all the lies, all the lies, so much so that we end up believing that they are the truth. Judah and his brothers had, they, they thought, what happened to Joseph was done. For years, they didn't have to worry about it. And now all of a sudden, they're not knowing it's Joseph in front of them, they're confronted with all the things they did to Joseph. But notice what happens to Joseph when he hears what's gonna happen to his dad. Hey, if, if we don't come back with Benjamin, dad's gonna, our dad's gonna die. He loves him so much. He's already lost his, his first favorite. And now he's about to lose this next one. And notice in chapter 45 what happens to Joseph when he realizes that he doesn't want to hurt his dad. Verse one, then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go out from me. 
So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians of the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was that you who sent me, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord over of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then, they fell on his, then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after that his brothers talked with him. And the scene is amazing here. Joseph just couldn't hold it in anymore. And not just that he wanted to, you know, show his brothers, hey, it's me. He realized he was now about to hurt his dad. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to honor his father still. And so he finally says, everyone get out except these guys. And he says, I'm Joseph. And he starts saying, I'm Joseph. How's my dad? And as he's saying this, his brothers are just sitting there like, what? (laughs) You know, it's just... You just see they're, they're trying to process everything. You're Joseph, but you're the king of the land and all this stuff. And they're, they're probably saying, well, when he, said, when he asked about dad, when he asked about Benjamin, starting to make sense. And, and Joseph is just like, he's, you know, verbally just pouring out, asking all these questions. They just couldn't believe it. But now notice what Joseph does when he reveals himself to his brothers. He doesn't say, ha, got you guys. Now you guys are going to serve me for the rest of your life. He doesn't do any of that. In fact, before they can even start saying, we're so sorry, oh my gosh, you know, start kissing his feet or anything, before they even get there, he doesn't even allow himself to have that satisfaction. And I say that because Our world today, our culture today tells us to have that satisfaction. Let them grovel at your feet a little bit. Let them feel the pain they made you feel just a little bit. Still forgive them. That's a good thing to do. That's a nice, that's the Christian thing to do. But let them feel it a little bit. No, before they could even start doing that, Joseph says, don't be upset with yourselves, guys. Don't be angry at yourselves. Even though you sold me into slavery to Egypt, you didn't send me here. Notice what he says. God sent me here. God is the one who orchestrated all of this. He gives all the glory to God the whole time. Everything that happened was orchestrated by God. Even the evil that they had planned was used by God for his purposes and for the good of the family of Joseph. He says, God sent me here before you to preserve life, to save you guys, to save your families. That's what Paul says in Romans 8, 28. All things work together for the good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. All things work together for the good. What do you think all things means in the Greek? All things. 
Not some things, not most things, all things. And as a child of God, that's hard to understand sometimes, right? Some of you are like, man, that job I'm working, I don't know if that's part of that, all things. (laughs) That relationship I have, I don't know if that's part of that, all things. My family I have, I don't know if that's the all things. My neighbor, I don't know if that's part of the, I don't know if he's part of the all things. (laughs) But if we're God's children, if he's our Lord, then it should be easy to understand that all things are orchestrated and held together by the Lord, worked out by him for our good. Not for our desires, but for our good. And if you're a parent, you understand that a child's good isn't always what they want, right? We understand that as parents, but when it comes to the Lord parenting us, we're like, yeah, I don't get that, God. That's not what I want. Joseph's like, imagine if God told Joseph, you know, when he had the dream of his brothers bowing down to him. And he said, you know what? What's gonna happen, Joseph? You're gonna be sold into slavery, and when you're in slavery, you're going to be falsely accused of rape and you're going to be thrown in jail. And when in jail, you're going to do some cool things, but then you're going to be forgotten about. Joseph would probably say, you know, Lord, I think there's an easier way <laughs> to have that done. <laughs> Is there a way where we can skip the jail, the falsely accused, the slavery, the, all the forgottenness? Can, can we for skip all that? It was for Joseph's good. And not just Joseph's good, but it was for the good of Joseph's family, of of Israel's family, of Israel, the nation Israel. Joseph says, there's five more years of famine. You're not gonna make it. You guys need to come here and live with us. For us this evening, wherever you are, whatever the Lord has for you, it's for your good. And I'll tell you this, his will for us is not always what our plans are. Not always what our desires are. For Joseph and his family, or Jacob and his family, the Lord was working out this whole thing. And notice what's brought forth. Not revenge, but reconciliation. The work of God is, is always is very apparent. It's always reconciliation. God's never in the, in the business of revenge. In fact, he tells his people that they're not to take revenge on others. He goes, I'm a God of justice. I'll take care of it. Justice belongs to him. Joseph understood this, and in the end, there's reconciliation. Notice what happens in verse 16 as we finish up this chapter. Four chapters, by the way. You guys are great. Now report. Now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this. Load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded, do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh and he gave them provisions for their journey. He gave all to all of them, to each man, changes of garments, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. And he sent them, sent to his father's house these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the goods of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away and they departed. And he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he did not believe him. That almost killed their father. (laughs) But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, 
And when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Look at how God's promise is even fulfilled here for Joseph's family. Pharaoh steps up and says, Oh, this is your family, Joseph? Here, take everything. Take these carts. Take all the best of the land of Egypt, and it's yours. Interestingly enough, when Joseph's family in the later generations leave Egypt, the same thing happens, although it's not in the most um, gracious vein. But when the Israelites leave Egypt, they're actually they're, when they leave, the Egyptians are just giving them all their goods and possessions and cattle and everything just to get them out of the land. Just, Please leave us. You guys are a thorn in our side. When they get to the land here at the beginning, the same thing happens. They're given all these provisions. If there's one thing you can really see throughout the whole Old Testament and, and also the New Testament, but it's really spoken of in the Old Testament, is the Lord provides for his people. They never have to worry, they never have to work of themselves. But the Lord provides for them. And this is all true for the believer today. God's plan, God's provision, God's preservation. See, God has chosen us as his children through his will. God has provided for us through his own son, salvation. Not someone else's son, but his own son. Jacob's son was sent to Egypt to preserve the life of his family. Well, guess what? God didn't send Jacob's son again. God sent his own son to preserve our life. And God has preserved us through his Holy Spirit to continue to walk in the newness of life that he has given us to walk with him. And he gives us all these things, all these provisions. They're not the things of this world necessarily, but there are the things we need. And so as we look at the story of Joseph and Jacob and his brothers and all these things, what we really see is who our God is. He's in control. He's providing for us. He's preserving us. He's caring for us and he's giving us exactly what we need. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for your provision, Lord. Your preservation, Lord, your newness of life. Thank you for giving us life, Lord, and help us to continue to walk in that this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why don't we stand for this last song?